Good evening, everyone. And uh, tonight we uh, continue our discussion of uh, thought of negligence. Uh, after this, or hopefully another one, you should be able to uh, finish uh, every point which need to be revised as far as thought of negligence is concerned. For that matter, we should be ready to be able to engage uh, any question which may come our way with respect to that particular uh, form of thought or that aspect of thought. So we uh, discussed uh, yesterday uh, the fact that to bring a successful action in uh, thought of negligence, you must be able to establish the three requirements, existence of duty of care, breach of duty of care, and resultant injury. And of course, we added that the injury or the damage for which you are seeking to recover compensation should not be too remote from the breach of the duty of care. So we look at the, the general principle that uh, where duty of care has been established, then that is not a difficult, but there are also instances where the court has not previously recognized that a duty of care may exist. And the court may need to work out as whether in a particular uh, uh, new or novel scenario presented to it, whether the court will be prepared to recognize the existence of duty of care. So we alluded to Lord Atkins famous dictum in Dodogo and Stevenson. And then we also look at how Caparo against uh, Dickman has also come to clarify that when it comes to recognizing a sense of duty of care in a, a new situation. Uh, the court will also bring policy consideration to bear as whether it is just, whether it is fair, whether it is reasonable, recognize a sense of duty of care in such a new situation. And uh, tonight we would like to continue uh, looking at other situations uh, in which the issue as whether a duty of care should be recognized as existing or not have actually uh, played out. So we will address economic loss, economic loss, and by economic loss, I'm referring to financial losses, which are not attributable to physical harm, uh, caused to the plaintiff, uh, to the plaintiff or uh, his property. Uh, so any uh, loss, right, which is not physical, it can be loss of profits, loss of trade, loss of investment revenue. So if, for example, you are saying that a person's action or omission may do to lose profits or may do to lose uh, trade or lose investment revenue. Can you actually recover compensation uh, for that? Now, that is a typical scenario of uh, economic loss or financial loss as uh, it were. So uh, we have separate set of rules relating to recovery of economic loss. The reason being that the courts have consistently felt that there's a need to ensure that a defendant does not attract unlimited liability or limitless liability as a result of his actions. Of course, once uh, a tort visa, that is a defendant has uh, put up a particular uh, conduct not expected of him or has omitted to do something uh, as it were, uh, you may have the rare difficulty as whether the plaintiff should be allowed to recover compensation for all losses, especially uh, losses which are not physical, losses which are financial. So, the Pandora box, as it were, will have been uh, opened 
or it may be on the tangent of slippery slope. So therefore, uh, the law is careful to actually determine when it will be appropriate to recover economic uh, loss. So let us uh, keep that in mind. And the other point to note is that uh, a lot of uh, uh, conducts which may give rise to uh, thought, as we know, affects finite number of people and give rise to largely determinate uh, harm. That is to say that instances in which the court have recognized that a tortious liability actually exists. You may not be speaking to a whole population. Oftentimes, you may be speaking to, if you like, a particular uh, number or particular group of people. And for that matter, you are able to uh, control uh, how far you expose the tortfeasor to liability. And for that matter, uh, to be able to recover for uh, you know, economic loss, you need to uh, you know, bring yourself with you what you call it, the appeal, like the economic loss. So for example, if someone is driving a car and the person uh, you know, carelessly, as it were, uh, or whatever, crashes into an electricity uh, pole or substation as a result of the negligent driving. And the electricity supply to an industrial uh, estate, uh, maybe any of the industrial estate that you know in Ghana can think of, and shopping center is cut off for let's say eight good hours. Now you notice that if you take, let me take an example, well, maybe like probably speaking from, let's say, uh, Kumase. You take like the Kumase shopping mall as it were. So let's suppose that the electricity substation just around the stadium, you're driving there and you negligently crash into that, uh, leading to the disruption in the power supply for eight hours, uh, 10 hours. Now what has happened is that if you have people running cool stores, their things are going to go bad because of no electricity. Uh, other businesses which depend upon power to be able to run and attract customers, they are going to be out of business for the period that the, the power disruption remain unresolved. So the question is, the person who negligently crashed the car into the electricity substation leading to uh, the disruption of the power and all the various uh, losses that we are uh, uh, you know, witnessing, should he be made to bear liability for all the losses, the various uh, incomes, the various revenue being lost by businesses within the vicinity affected badly uh, by the disruption of the power supply, which also emanates from the negligent driving of the driver crashing into the substation. So that is the challenge. Indeed, if that were to be uh, the, the, no, the situation, uh, no insurance company will prefer to give uh, insurance policy because if you are going to give insurance policy, you want to be able to do uh, some estimate and have a, a reasonable sense of the maximum uh, quantum of uh, loss, which you may have to, for example, bear as a result of the insurance policy. But from the example I gave you, you notice that it's not that simple for uh, you to actually have a good idea of how much losses in terms of uh, revenue losses are going to manage from uh, the negligent action that we are looking at. So uh, therefore, uh, peer economic loss 
uh, which is not consequential on physical damage to the plaintiff uh, property is not recoverable in tort. So let us keep that proposition of law in mind that uh, if you have pure economic loss, which does not emanate from physical damage to the plaintiff property, you cannot recover uh, compensation for that uh, in tort. And for that matter, uh, most cases will actually uh, you know, turn on uh, whether the particular loss suffered is pure economic loss or not. So economic losses can be caused by damage to property, as you have seen, acquisition of defective goods or property. So let us keep in mind, if you have any scenario and the particular uh, you know, kind of compensation you're contemplating, it does not relate to, let's say, injuries or physical damage emanating from the alleged degradant action or the breach of duty of care, you need to ask yourself, is it then pure economic loss? Pure economic loss in the sense that uh, maybe loss of money or other income or revenue, which is not connected to the physical damage or the physical injury caused by the, I mean, caused to the, the plaintiff's property by, let's say, the tort visa. If that is the case, you cannot recover. So let us keep that in mind. So let's look at the, the two scenarios where economic losses are caused, uh, you know, caused by damage to property of the plaintiff, and then where it as a result of defective goods having been sold to the property uh, as it were. So damage to uh, property. Uh, then the principle of the law is that economic loss, which is a direct uh, consequence of physical damage is an exception to the general rule that economic loss is not recoverable in tort. So as you are noticing, we've stated the general position that economic losses are not recoverable. One exception is if the economic loss is a direct result, is a direct consequence of physical damage, then that will be recoverable. And we all know the, the case of Spartan Steel and Alloys Limited. Spartan Steel and Alloys Limited against Martin and Co. Contractors Limited. Decided in 1973, if you remember. The plaintiffs in the Spartan case manufactured stainless uh, steel alloys at the factory 24 hours a day. So they more or less operated the 24 seven. The defendant's employees who were working on a nearby road damaged the electrical supply cable to the factory. So the electricity board shut off the power supply, to the factory for almost 15 hours until the cable was fixed. The plaintiff scrapped a melt in the furnace reducing its value by, uh, let's say, 368 pounds. Now, during the trial, it was demonstrated that if the supply had not been cut off, if there had been continuous supply of power, the company would have made a profit of 400 pounds on the melt. And the 1,767 on another four melts, which you have been put into the furnace. So therefore, the plaintiff claimed damages from the defendant in respect of these three sums of money, the 400 pounds that they have lost, the 1,767 that uh, they've lost, and also the reduction in the original uh, value to 368. They wanted to recover uh, compensation you know, 
for all this. And, and the matter made its way to court. The court held that the plaintiff could recover the damage to the melt in progress and the loss of profit on that melt. So the melt, which was being worked on when the, the power disruption occurred, the court was of the view that you could recover uh, compensation for the losses that you have uh, incurred by not being able to you know, complete it in the usual order. And the court noted further that the plaintiff could not recover for the loss of profit during the time that the electricity was switched off. So for the nearly 15 hours, when there was no power, and for that matter, they could not operate. The court said that the monies that they could have made if they operated within the 15 hours, but for the electricity, could not be recovered. Could not be recovered. And the, because in the court's view, the damage to the melt in progress, the one which was already in fairness, was a physical damage. And the loss of profit on it was a direct consequence of the physical damage. So you have something in the process, then all of a sudden power goes off. Now the power going off is going to affect that which is being processed. So that is what the court was trying to say. And that's why the court said that uh, that one is a direct uh, uh, consequence. So therefore, if you could not finish it and then the money which will have come to you, for example, is not coming, uh, that can be linked to the fact that the process could not, you know, could not uh, continue because the power had been taken away. And so that type of you know, financial loss is considered a direct consequence of the physical damage. And for that matter, it is recoverable. And the loss of profits, right? The loss of profit, uh, which the company experienced was also considered a pure economic loss and not recoverable. So students, ladies and gentlemen, the takeaway uh, from the case of Spartan Steel is that where the, uh, the loss of profit, the loss of revenue is a direct consequence of the physical damage caused by the negligent acts of the defendant or the tort freezer, the plaintiff will be allowed to recover compensation. Let us uh, keep that in mind. And that is why Lord Denning, in his usual able characteristics uh, manner, in Spartan still made the point that, quote, I think the question of recovering economic loss is one of policy. Whenever the courts draw a line, to mark out the bounds of duty. They do it as to limit the responsibility of the defendant. It seems to me better to consider the particular relationship in hand and see whether or not as a matter of policy, economic loss should be coverable or not. So Lord Denning trying to rationalize that when it comes to allowing certain uh, loss of income or loss of profit uh, to be recovered you know, as a thought of negligence depend very much upon the, the, you know, the, 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 the policy posture of the court in order not to overburden a defendant. Otherwise, uh, life will become unbearable. You make one mistake and all manner of financial losses are going to be blamed on you. That would be really, really, really uh, quite terrible. Another way in which a economic loss is also encountered is in the area of acquisition of defective goods or property. So when it comes to uh, goods or property which are defective, uh, then the law is that the plaintiff who is trying to uh, make a claim regarding the defective goods or property is in the same situation as how the other cases of economic loss is treated. So just as uh, 
pure economic loss is not recoverable. In the same vein, uh, if you have uh, uh, defective goods or property, you cannot uh, recover it as a thought. Of course, it's different from a uh, contract. So contract and also sale of goods law uh, because of the uh, uh, warranty and uh, or condition as to quality and all that, you will be able to recover. But here we are talking about thought. And that was why in the case of Ans and Merton Landing Borough Council, the plaintiffs were tenants of a block of flights built in accordance with plans approved by the council. That is the London, Merton Landing Borough Council. The foundations were too shallow. So the defendants sued for the cost of making the flat safe on the basis that the council either negligently approved inadequate plans or failed to inspect the foundations during construction. Now, the court held that a duty of care was owed by the council and that if their inspectors did not exercise proper care and skill, then the council was liable, even though the loss suffered was economic loss. So here, sometimes you see a bit of a, uh, a different push are being given uh, by But the, the Anne's case certainly seemed to have conflated or uh, brought some confusion in the law. So therefore, uh, about uh, 40 years or so ago in 1991, the House of Laws had the opportunity in the case of Murphy. Murphy is M U R. PHY against Brentwood District Council to clarify the situation in the light of the confusion caused by the case of Hans Martin and also Junior Brooks. Now, in Matthew against Brentwood District Council, the council approved plans for a concrete raft upon which properties were built. The rafts moved and caused cracks in the walls of a property which was sold for 35,000 pounds, less than it would have done had it not been defective. The English House of Laws overruled the case of Hans Merton and came to the conclusion that the council was not liable in absence of physical injury. So going back to the orthodoxy that you would not be able to claim for pure economic loss where it is not emanating from uh, physical damage or physical injury. So peer economic loss does not emanate from physical injury or uh, physical damage. And for that matter, it's not recoverable. But then if the economic loss can be linked to the damage, which have the occasion to uh, a property belonging to the plaintiff or whatever, then you will be able to uh, sue. So therefore, the takeaway is that economic loss arising from negligent act or mission is not recoverable. So that is a general rule. Now, what about yesterday? Somebody asked a question about uh, nervous shock and I said, that, okay, regarding existence of a uh, duty of care, we also test it in the context of Psychiatric uh, injury, psychiatric injury, that is another uh, field, another uh, area in which we test whether a duty of care exists or does not uh, exist. And when we talk about physical injury here, what are we uh, referring to? Uh, physical injury. So physical injury, or sorry, not physical injury, I mean the psychiatric injuries. Psychiatric injury here, as opposed to physical injury, uh, we are talking about one which is distinguishable medically. In other words, medicine or medical knowledge should actually uh, recognize such a psychiatric injury. 
the number of uh, conditions which have been uh, tested by the case law as being medically recognized as psychiatric injury. We can have a number of example. Maybe you take the post-traumatic stress disorder. If you look at the cases like Leach against the chief constable of Gloucestershire, the court recognized it as a medically recognized uh, psychiatric injury. Or miscarriage, where there's a miscarriage. Uh, the case of Bohill and Yang, you remember that case? And also the case of He and Yang. The court has recognized uh, you know, miscarriage as a medically recognized uh, psychiatric uh, injury. So the psychiatric damage we are referring to here, which can give rise to recoverable uh, you know, damages or compensation must be caused by a sudden event. So that is very important. It must have been caused by a sudden event, event which just happened to you just like that. And for that matter, in the case of ARCOC, against Chief Constable of Yorkshire, uh, the police allowed a large crowd of football supporters, just like the, if you like, the May uh, 9 incident of Ghana. So the police allowed a large crowd of uh, football supporters into an already crowded stand, which was surrounded by a high perimeter fence. And the chaos ensued. And in the chaos, 95 people were crashed to death. So uh, various claims were brought by those who were present at the scene and those who had also viewed the event on television. Maybe on your television, you see that there's a commotion in the stadium, people are dying, and you later on you claim that as a result of that sight, you suffered uh, what you call a psychiatric what, injury. For that matter, you want the court to allow you to recover compensation. So it was in that context that uh, in ARCOC against Chief Constable of South Yorkshire, uh, Lord Akna, Lord Akna uh, made the point that uh, shock involves the sudden appreciation by sight or sound of a horrifying sight or sound or horrifying event, which violently agitates the mind. It has yet to include psychiatric illness caused by accumulation over a period of time of more gradual assaults on the nervous system. So by the principle enunciated by Lord Atka in ARCOC against Chief Constable, the, that would should be reckoned as psychiatric uh, injury must have that element of a sadness, sadness, like it must have happened suddenly. And that is why the court is saying that if you have a normal psychiatric illness, that will not be recognized as giving rise to a, a, a duty of care. That which can give rise to a duty of care is where it was not already there, which has built on, if you like, gradually over a period of time, but that the, it happened to the, the, the plaintiff all of a sudden when the plaintiff was not really anticipating anything uh, like that. So let us keep that in mind. Now, as whether a duty of care in the context of uh, new psychiatric injury has caused suddenly that we've explained will give rise to a duty of care, the law is that the plaintiff must have been a reasonably foreseeable victim. Was the plaintiff a reasonably foreseeable victim? In other words, having regard to the plaintiff, can we say that the defendant who is a tort visa in the, this case, reasonably, could he have foreseen that uh, by his uh, action, which has created whatever sin, which the plaintiff is going to also uh, watch some will become so close to. Could he have foreseen that the defendant will be traumatized? Was it, so you see that the, the, the 
the reasonable uh, reasonable foreseeability test that we made is still coming back. Uh, then the court also distinguished between what we call like the primary victims and then uh, secondary victims. So as far as uh, nervous shock, psychiatric injury, so to speak, are concerned, we are talking about first primary victims. So primary victims are those who are directly involved in the incident, right? They are the primary vict victims. So therefore, if we look at the ACO case against the chief constable, uh, those who had to intervene to rescue uh, the people that were perishing as a result of a chaos and the commotion, they, they were placed in the class of primary victims. They were placed in the case of primary victims. Then we also have secondary victims. Uh, secondary victims must satisfy the test laid down in our court case. And what is that test? That there must be a close relationship of love and affection for the primary victim. So if you are not directly involved in the incident, right, as a primary victim, but you also want to be able to recover damages for psychiatric injury, then you are a secondary victim. For that matter, the law requires that there must have been a close relationship of love and affection uh, between you and the primary victim. Of course, for uh, parents, when it comes to parents and a the child, there's a rebuttable presumption that uh, they always be, uh, if you like, uh, a secondary uh, victim and the law gives them that benefit unless the, you, you can bring a countervailing evidence to show that uh, they were not, uh, they, we didn't have you know, that kind of like the love and affection uh, between them and the primary victim. Otherwise, the presumption is there. The same thing applies, applies to uh, spouses. What about ordinary passerbys? Are they primary or secondary? Now for ordinary passers by, maybe like you are passing by, then there's a terrible incident, you know, scene going on and you witness it. If what you witness was particularly horrific, then the law is that uh, you could claim compensation as a secondary victim of that. So let us keep that uh, in mind. But uh, there are also, there's also been another uh, you know, point, of course, not is already there as part of the requirement for negligence, but giving more emphasis that uh, as whether there should have been proximity. In other words, uh, the person who is seeking to claim as either primary victim or secondary victim should there have been a certain level of closeness, certain level of proximity between him and the third visa? And that is why the case of McLawline, McLawline and O'Brien, a 1983 case is very important uh, because that concern, you know, psychiatric injury, especially that the geographical uh, proximity as well as temporal uh, proximity that is in terms of like time. Now in McLaurin and O'Brien, as you remember, as I said, this is just a revision, you know it already. The plaintiff's husband and children were involved in a road accident. The plaintiff, who was two miles away at the time, was told, that is the wife, was told of the accident about two hours later by a neighbor who took her to hospital to see her family. Now, while she was there, she learned that her youngest daughter had been killed. And she saw her husband and other children and eventually witnessed the nature and extent of their injuries. And they were still in the same state 
us at the scene, covered in oil and mud. So the plaintiff brought an action in Naval Shock that having seen uh, you know, the husband and the other children in the condition that they were, he has become traumatized. For that matter, we like to get compensation. Well, the court held that the Naval Shock suffered was the reasonably foreseeable result of the injuries to her family caused by the defendant's negligence and was therefore entitled to recover uh, damages. Now, it was reasoned uh, further that before you can show that there was a proximity, there was that level of closeness between you, the plaintiff, trying to claim or sue for nervous uh, shock, you need that to be present at the time of the accident. Or if we are not present at the time of the accident, you must have come upon the immediate aftermath. So let's suppose that, uh, let's, let me give this specific example. Let's suppose that uh, you have a, a relation, there's, a, if you remember the May 9 incident or the gas explosion, for example, uh, at the atomic junction in Accra. So let's suppose that you have uh, someone who works in the nearby shop over there. Then there's this uh, unfortunate news that uh, there's a gas explosion is on the television. Uh, people are bent, some are almost bent washes and things like that. So in terms of uh, proximity between you and uh, whoever caused the you know, cause the fire or the explosion leading to the you know, the burning more or less into ashes of your relatives. According to uh, the reason in McLaughlin uh, case, if, for example, you're not even there when it happened, but you come upon the immediate aftermath, you still satisfy the requirement of proximity. So let us uh, keep that uh, in mind. Uh, I think uh, because of time, uh, we will uh, just go straight and look at a uh, breach of duty of care. Otherwise, you will not uh, finish discussion of uh, uh, duty of care. But before that, I will pause for a question or two if anybody uh, or any contribution. All right, so good morning. Yes. Good morning. Um, so yesterday you put a question. So in, in able to uh, resolve it, it is how the approach will be like. That first, you, you begin from Donogio with the elements, and then you come to the Caparo, what they also made some changes to the, the earlier position in Donogo. And then you come and discuss uh, under the special conditions upon which a duty of care may be seen to have risen between people. Is that how you go about it? Y yes. Yeah, because if you uh, remember uh, yesterday's uh, question, uh, as we indicated, the court was try the question was trying to uh, suggest that those uh, situations uh, in which due to of care be recognized, just as uh, we are told that the, the the categories of negligence are not close, but so whether due to of care will be recognized depend very much upon. Uh, the court's own determination. And the determination of the court, uh, at least through the lenses of Caparo, is very much also a question of policy. So whether the court, uh, after you know, making sure that we have the you know, reasonable uh, possibility of harm and so on, then the court will ask, is it just, is it fair, is it reasonable? 
for us to uh, recognize is this sense of a duty of care, for example, in this particular uh, instance, as it is, as it were. Yeah, so that is how you go about it. But, you know, examination uh, is time constraint. And that's why the fact that we've been uh, very extensive in trying to discuss uh, how duty of care may be recognized. Certainly in examination, nobody expect that uh, you will actually uh, go about it in the same way that we are doing it in the comfort and the luxury of our uh, rooms. We have a lot of time on hand, so let us keep that uh, in mind. And that is so there's something you call like the you know, capital selector. Like you have a lot of information in relation to the question, but you have uh, you know, a limited time. And don't forget that this type of uh, law examination, I mean the law school entry examination, there's nothing like, oh, the person was actually time constrained, so could not finish. So let us assume that if he or she had written, he or she have, will have probably like done the, the, the correcting. So let's give it to him. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So let us keep that in mind. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so now let's talk about breach of duty of care. The second requirement to bring successful uh, action in negligence is to show that there was a breach of duty of care. And this is very uh, straightforward. In talking about breach of duty of care, uh, first, we must have a standard of care. So the standard of care, that is like the, a particular level of care, which was expected of the defendant. And then the defendant failed to meet uh, that. Then again, we also have special standards of care, if you like. So as far as the general standard of care is concerned, as you remember, the court will always use the reasonable uh, person. So once you know it's established that a duty of care exists, and as you've noted, uh, you are next required to show that there has been a breach of the duty of care. And in trying to uh, show that there has been a breach of the duty of care, as I have uh, indicated uh, to you, you need to get the, the standard of care. And the standard of care, uh, as you know already, generally, is a standard of the reasonable man. The standard of the reasonable man. And what do you mean by that? That is to say that the court imagines that if a reasonable man were to be in the situation in which the tortfeasor found himself, what will the reasonable man have done? What will the reasonable man have done? So if the reasonable man, for example, have done something different from what the defendant uh, tortfeasor did, then we will say that the defendant actually breached the duty of care. So who is this uh, reasonable man? Well, if you look at the case of uh, Hall against Brooklands Auto Racing Club, Lord Justice Gray will describe the reasonable person as one, the man in the street, right? The man in the street, that's a reasonable man or the man on the crab home omnibus, or maybe we will say that the man on Kedjitia bus or the man on Makula throat, that is a reasonable man. Or the man who takes the magazines at home and in the evening pushes the lawnmower in his shirt sleeves, he is a reasonable man. And for that matter, we could say that the reasonable man who is used as a standard of care in trying to determine whether there's been a breach of duty of care, uh, we use, if we like, the average person, not a perfect person. So let's keep that in mind. 
and, and so to, to put it simply, the call to use the objective tests, right? Objective tests, and we are familiar with objective tests at least from a law of contract. So law of contract, talk about the officials by standard, the objective tests. So the same uh, idea, mutatis mutandis apply as far as uh, establishing a uh, breach of duty of care is concerned in thought. So the question is, what would a reasonable person have foreseen in the particular situation, rather than what did this particular defendant foresee in this particular situation? So you notice that I don't using the subjective uh, perspective of the defendant, and rather using the objective perspective of the reasonable person. But apart from the general standard of care, which is the, the, the standard of the reasonable man, we also have uh, certain situations in which the court will apply uh, special standards of care other than just the uh, reasonable uh, person or the objective test that we'll be discussing. So for example, where the defendant has a particular skill or profession, right? If the defendant uh, claims to have a particular skill or profession, then uh, he will be expected to do more than what the reasonable man on Clapham bus or the credit theater or the uh, macro theater will actually do. As happened in the case of Bolam against the uh, Ferian Hospital Management Committee. Those of you who've done medical law before, you know this case uh, very well, where a person was undergoing uh, a procedure called the ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, in the 1957, uh, the patient was actually not restrained and it involved, you know, uh, electrical shocks as part of the therapy. Now, due to uh, not being restrained, the patient actually fell and then uh, got paralyzed and decided to sue the hospital. Uh, you no, know, for uh, negligently allowing uh, him to suffer what he did. So when the matter eventually came to court, the court held that the standard of care for doctors is the standard of ordinary skilled man exercising and professing to have that special skill. So. In that case, during the trial, we had a dispute. Some doctors who came to testify said that uh, they would not have actually uh, used uh, restraints. Others said that they would have used a restraint. And the judge said that insofar as we have like some reasonable body of doctors who say that they would have, uh, for example, uh, done it in the same way as the defendant did. The court took the view that then the defendant was not liable for what? For negligence. But what is important here is that here you see that the court is trying to use a little bit special uh, you know, standard of care, different from what we know from the the general uh, position. Of course, uh, in Bulaito, right? In Bulaito against City and Hackney Health Authority, the, the special standard of care, which the court had actually introduced in the Bolam case as a standard of care to be used in trying to determine whether there had been a breach or duty of care now the court in the Bolito was of the view that it's not enough just for the plaintiff to bring, uh, you no, know, for the defendant to bring doctors who will testify and say that uh, they will have done what the the defendant did, and especially so if you also have some other doctors who also seriously disagree and say that they wouldn't have done what the defendant did, then what should the court do? In the Bolito. Uh, the court held that in a situation like that, the court can decide 
uh, that the body of person is not reasonable or responsible if it can be demonstrated that the professional opinion is not capable of withstanding logical analysis. That is to say that it is not enough, for example, uh, the defendant uh, told Fiza, the doctor has brought some doctors to come and testify to show that what he did, they too have done the same thing. Now let's suppose that the plaintiff has also got doctors to come and testify that they wouldn't have done what this particular defendant did. So where should the court stand? Which of these two uh, body of opinion should the court endorse? And it is within that context that the court made the point that then uh, the court can decide which of the body of opinion should actually uh, guide uh, the court. So let us uh, keep that in mind. So in a nutshell, we could say that uh, following on from Bolaito case, Bolam has now be, you know, become like a, a two-stage uh, test. First, if you are using the Bolam, the, did the doctor act in accordance with the practice accepted as proper by a respectable body of medical opinion? So that is one. And two, if so, is that practice reasonable and logical? In other words, if the defendant doctor or could say that, well, what I did, other doctors who have done that and so on and so forth. That claim that other doctors you have brought to have done that should pass straight logical analysis. And for that matter, if it does not stand up to logical scrutiny, then uh, you would not have actually escapated yourself from liability. So let us keep that in mind. Well, in a more recent time, we have the case of Montgomery against the Lacnache. So those who are doing the medical law, you know more all of this, and we will not let it detain us uh, any longer. Yeah, any question on the standard of care? No, sir. Okay. But let me, before we leave that, let me add that uh, when the court is trying to determine the standard of care in order to find out whether there has been a breach of duty of care, uh, the court will also uh, take into account certain matters. For example, the magnitude of the risk right, involved the cost and practicality of precautions, the social value of the defendant activities, and then what the reasonable person will have foreseen. So these are some of the matters that the court will take into account in trying to work out uh, the standard of care, which will be used to judge what the defendant did. Another point to note is that when you have satisfied the issue of the standard of care and all that, uh, who bears the burden of uh, proof? We know that part of the adversarial character of civil litigation is A in COVID probatio oritu. He who asserts must what? Must prove. If you are the person making the claim, then you have the burden to prove. So if you are the plaintiff saying that, the defendant uh, breach the duty of care. The plaintiff bears the burden of proof. But the good thing is that there are some situations in which the plaintiff may have assistance. For example, uh, where you make use of the evidential mazim, res ipsa lukuto, res ipsa lukuto. Uh, which simply means that the thing speaks for itself. So there are situations in which the court may be prepared to find a breach of duty against the defendant. And the court will not necessarily have taken detailed evidence. And for that matter, we could say that what the court has concluded is a prima facie case of what negligence. Now, before 
press ipsa locuto can be uh, properly invoked. Uh, certain requirements must be uh, satisfied. So let us keep that in mind. One, the, if the thing causing the damage is under the control of the defendant or someone for whose negligence the defendant is responsible. So that is the, the first requirement. The, whatever that you are saying that uh, for that thing being there is in itself evidence of negligence, we rest ipsa locuto. Now that will be entertained, it might be shown that that in which caused the damage was under the control of the, the, the tort fees or the defendant or someone uh, that he has responsibility over. And two, the cause of the accident is unknown. If you know the cause of the accident, if you, you cannot really invoke recipe salakuto. And three, the accident is such as would not normally occur without negligence. Now, if you look at what has occurred, in the usual scheme of things, these things don't occur unless someone has been negligent. So let us keep that uh, in mind. Now, where rest if liquidity, for example, applies, uh, what is the legal effect? It basically raises the prima facie presumption of what? negligence against the defendant. And for that matter, the defendant will have the reverse burden to explain how the accident could have occurred without negligence on his part. Okay, so we will end here and then. Next time we discuss causation and remoteness of damage and we take one problem based question at the end of discussion of the, the third aspect and we see how all these pieces of uh, the rules or the principle that we are learning uh, come together to enable us to answer any question which may be posed as far as uh, negligence is concerned. So if there's a question, I will take it otherwise uh, tomorrow we discuss the resulting damage and then the remoteness of damage. And we take a question which actually integrates all these three. Okay, in absence of uh, any questions, then I'll leave you tomorrow, God willing.